It's time for our first hot topic on the breakfast this morning. I'm going to take a look at the situation with our airlines. Foreign airlines are repatriating over $4 billion in 15 months. Foreign airlines have repatriated that sum in 15 months as it becomes more expensive to fly from Nigeria than other West African countries. And that's exactly what we want to be taking a look at this morning with Abraham Great, a public affairs analyst who's joining us from Ottawa in Canada this morning. Good morning to you, Abraham. Good morning to you. I'm so glad to be with you once again this morning. So glad to have you join us. Well, this is no good news for Nigerian travelers. I mean, it's just not good news at all. Two weeks ago, a friend of mine told me that his friend bought ticket to the U.S. for $2.4 million. Um, and uh, matter of fact, let me break it down for you here. We have um, going to London, London to Lagos fares, 49% higher than going from Accra to London. All right? And then 162% higher than going from Cotonou to London. So Nigerians are not having a good time. Nigerian travelers are not having a good time. Nigerians do travel a lot, and a lot of them have very good reasons to travel. Tell us what you make of this crazy increase in, in, in the fares of uh, air traveling. Um, I think it's really, really pathetic to be in this uh, kind of situation for Nigerians. Number one, because Nigeria is one of the top five uh, most, uh, you know, traveling country in the world. When you take China, Pakistan, uh, uh, sorry, India and Pakistan, Nigeria is top. So for every airline that you find around the world, we're very profitable, we're very viable routes, particularly the uh, London, Lagos, New York, Lagos, Paris, Lagos, Amsterdam, Lagos, you know, uh, uh, Berlin, Lagos, stop. Every single day you see that these flights are full. And sometimes you can think of it that it's almost that uh, the system is taking advantage of Nigerians because we are very rugged people. No matter what the price of anything is, we will always pay. And it's painful. Some of us travel so frequently, like myself. I travel so frequently that sometimes it's just unfair. In that 15-month period that you are talking about now, for example, mm -hmm. I would have been in Nigeria about seven or eight times in 15 months already. And, you know, some of us will not even fly economy. You'll fly maybe a business or premium economy. A business class that you buy for maybe London, Lagos before for about 3,000 pounds. You're talking about six, 7,000 pounds. So it becomes nearly impossible to fly even when you want to fly premium economy, sometimes it's just around the, the you know, very uh, uh, exorbitant um, prices. But we are being taken advantage of by a system. And first of all, you have to understand that, uh, particularly in the last, you know, one year or two years, the Nigerian financial infrastructure, you know, is completely, completely out of it. Was could not cope with IATA could not cope with international standard of practice. So you see a lot of tra uh, the, a lot of monies were trapped in Nigerian Central Bank. So these airlines are not able to repatriate their, uh, their dollar or their uh, ad end money. So when you don't see that fluidity, what happens is that the insurance to trade in Nigeria become higher. So the, 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 it's almost like a risk management system for those airlines. So they have to up their, uh, their ante, not their ante, they have to up their price in order for them to be able to recover when they'll be losing money that is supposed to come back to them within maybe a few hours or a few days is in the Nigerian system. And Nigerians suffer it in more than airlines also where you're trying to send money abroad or you're trying to repatriate money abroad the, the the lack of fluidity in our financial system is causing distress okay so let's look at some of the causes well you've mentioned one of them the lack of fluidity the, the, the forex reforms is, is it has shut the price up by 50 percent um the controversy surrounding the national carrier because some believe that if we had some national carriers, it would have reduced the monopoly that we see going on in that sector. And then, of course, you, you have a situation where uh, funds 
are being trapped. Ayata, which you just alluded to, says that 743.7 million of foreign airline funds are trapped here, and it is the highest in the world. Why has this persisted? Why, have we, why, why do we continue to hear about this money being trapped in the country? I mean, it is uh, very funny that you look at the last uh, administration of the um, central bank. We don't seem to understand what is going on. We saw the issue that they had with the Naira, uh, in Naira. You saw all kinds of monetary policy. The monetary policy of the central bank has stifled uh, the uh, you know, international air travel in the country, not only that, Astra typhoon to many businesses, shut down many businesses. So I don't seem to understand what is happening with that administration or the administration of the central bank. Something definitely is wrong. And it was important for the government, particularly the last administration, to have acted promptly, either to uh, you know remove the administrators or to whatever it, it has to be whatever has to be done was not done on time things were left and then you know a bad situation went from bad to worse so we need leadership we need to be able to have intervention and very very quickly that did not happen how can this how, so what is the way forward is, is it completely hopeless so so one of the things that we need to do uh, is first of all government has to remove itself from the encumbrance of thinking that government had to uh, own a national air carrier. You know, I mean, in some cases, it will work well, but in a country such as ours, where we are, we are, we are struggling with too many things, I would advise government not to uh, put all their head in thinking that, oh, the solution is we have to have a national carrier. If we have a national carrier, it will be a national pride. You know, I used to enjoy flying Nigerian Airways, you know, in those days. I used I remember that I used to go to London for as little as maybe 95,000 Naira, you know, back then, maybe 2000, uh, uh, maybe 2000, 2001, 2002, uh, and stuff like that. You should be able, you are able to travel to and fro for about 105, 150,000 Naira. I mean, the, that, that is no longer the case. So look at Air Peace, for example. That is, uh, that is an entrepreneur in the country that the country can actually look at empowering. I listened to the president, you know, last week or, yeah, I think last week or two weeks ago, when he gave a national address and we we're talking about some money that was going to be appropriated or disbursed, you know, among businesses. You look at a business like Airpiece or Aero Contractor or some mm. of the uh, airlines that are giving their best, they are trying their best. Empower them. We don't have to be Air Nigeria before we can solve problems for Nigerians. You know, fund them, help them to be able to have more international routes, help them to be able to have better infrastructure, give them loans, give them, you know, grants, give them as many things. The other thing is that there are many other uh, airlines who are trying to enter into the market. But from what I understand, the barriers to entry and the regulations in Nigeria in getting a license or in getting more routes for those existing airlines are very stringent. We have to understand that the bottlenecks we have around doing business in Nigeria is killing Nigerian businesses, is killing Nigerian opportunities, and is even killing international bilateral relationship between Nigeria and many other countries. Yeah, well, you, you just mentioned uh, Airpiece on uh, Airpiece. I, I remember watching an interview he granted on national television trying to debunk some of the allegations against him, uh, leveled against him by Hadi Sirika. You know, they had this back and forth issues. And he, he, you, you almost weep listening to him how frustrating it was for, it's been for him to run his business. And here we have, here we have on one of the national dailies this morning, uh, six aircraft minimum regulation for startup airlines causes stare. So some of these bottlenecks that do not encourage uh, the private sector to go into this um, and, and, and ease things up. Because Nigerian Air, for instance, that we've also talked about, fine, we don't have it yet. And when all this um, crisis came up, the controversies that came up uh, with Hadi Sirika and how he went about it, 
So many Nigerians were saying, even if this were to come on, they wouldn't enter this play because they just cannot trust it. I mean, the, the issue of trust for Nigerians is all about safety. Uh, you know, because when the airline is new, there was a time that uh, uh, a, 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 one airline was introduced, if I can remember, I think it was Bellevue. Uh, Bellevue. Uh, Be Bellevue used to rival Nigerian Airways at some point, and then we have Air Niger Nigerian Air uh, who, that was owned by, you know, uh, Richard Branson and, uh, uh, you know, now Senator Jimo Ibrahim, whom I know very, very well. Uh, the, the, the issue there is that Nigeria need to trust. So when you see that airline has flown a few times, you see that people will be able to trust it. But here is the problem. We have a very insular problem, or Nigeria, we're, we're quite insular as a country. So when you look at other nations like, you know, the UK, France, uh, Germany, America, they own this airline or their private sectors own this airline. But when you look at the component of the staffing, you see people from all around the world. The problem with us, Nigeria, is that we want to own things 100% and we want to manage everything 100%. There are expertise. The area of aviation is something that we have not excelled extremely well in. It does not mean we're not competent. We may be competent in flying. We may be competent in many other things, but we might not be competent in management. Employ foreigners who are going to run this thing. You know, that is what British Airways will do. British Airways will employ a Nigerian, a Ghanaian, a, a, a Japanese, a Chinese. So you see that the management is, uh, is, is made up of culturally diverse people hired based on competence but when you see a nigerian company we want to run our businesses by ourselves and yet we participate we're in yahoo we are in uh in gmail we are in google we are in facebook we're in every other company around the world but when it comes to businesses from nigeria I, i'm not saying not at all not that we don't employ foreigners at all but we don't bring in experts enough. Let these airlines be run by foreigners and experts. You will see that Nigerians begin to trust. Now, let me make this last point uh, about that. There's a relationship now in which um, the Nigerian air is going to be owned. 49% uh, of it is going to be owned by Ethiopia Airlines. Ethiopia Airlines airline has been one of the most successful global airline carrier. I mean, around the world. So one of the things that I noticed in that deal is that Ethiopian airlines are taking over the management. That is not a shame to Nigeria. That is okay. So when you see them manage and they manage it well, then they can pass on that, you know, that management capability, that, you know, human capital can be passed on to Nigeria. Maybe I will give it, say, between five to ten years period, even more than that, something that will last long should take a lot more time to, you know, uh, to heal or to, to, to train or to develop. Well, the thing with this 49% uh, Ethiopian airline stake um, in, in Nigeria's uh, air, national air carrier that I believe made Nigerians quite uncomfortable was it, what appeared to be deception with that aircraft that they brought and the whole razzmatazz about it, Nigerians became uncomfortable, not sure what to believe anymore about the whole contract. Do you share that sentiment? That's a, that was a very funny fiasco, if you, if you ask me, and I think that was just politics. The politics of election that was playing at that time, and the outgoing government probably want to impress, or the members of the cabinet of that uh, administration want to impress people. So you see logo, you see uh, 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 you, you, all kind of, uh, for me, I call it shenanigan uh, at that time. But it does not mean that everything that was coming out were false. The business deal was on the table, but I just think some who were trying to paint that government good were doing too many things that were unnecessary uh, uh, at that time. So, I mean, that, that's what I see in that, uh, uh, at that time. We have to focus on the meat of the issue. The contract uh, is publicly available. Yeah, but all of that, all of that shenanigan, as you put it, have cast aspersions on the whole deal. 
I mean, you know, when there, there's a situation where, or we're looking at a situation where someone is confirmed to be lying or be a liar, you begin to say, you know, when this person tells you good morning, you need to check your time. Maybe that's the kind of, <laughs> that's what eventually became of the whole situation. Even though, as you said, yeah, the contracts are there for people to look at, but there are people who have questions about the sincerity of some of those who are vested in that contract? You, you, our vested interest uh, is based on our passion as Nigerians. And you have to understand that performance is, uh, is people are under pressure for performance in Nigeria right now, that we need to take, uh, we need to be very uh, cautious of the pressures we put on performance. I'll give you a, 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 a little bit of digression. You look at uh, roads, road construction, like maybe Lagos, Ibadan Expressway, and what have you. There are global standards for projects, for execution of projects. So, and, and I'm sure you've been abroad, you've been to UK and what have you. Mm -hmm. In the UK, we have, we, we have a road that is called the M1 or the M25. And I recall that there was a time where they were repairing the M1 and putting, just adding one more lane, I took it, it took about seven or eight years. That every time, because I lived, when I was living in the UK, or I still have a home in the UK, but I, I now live in Canada, uh, but if, I, I live in Milton Kings, and I almost have to be in London nearly every other day or every day of being at Heathrow, Heathrow Airport. You will be in traffic, and this lasted for years. Now, when they make that road, it may take that six to seven or eight years, but you are sure that that is a road they can use for the next 50 years. If they, you, but in our own case, oh, they have not finished repairing the road. Oh, the plane has not landed. We rush, we just want everything like yesterday. We need to also allow projects. At the back of that, we have a corruption problem that is uh, 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 endemic. And that is procurement. Every time you see government opportunity, you see new startups, you see something that is about to happen, you know, so many demons, I will call it demons, are already lurking at the back of that procurement to make a fortune. So that is why you also see that Nigerians are trying to probe what is going on here. And I think, I think, under the new administration, looking at what that administration did in Lagos, when procurement is automated, payment systems are automated, and experts are handling, are handling the management and the administration and the leadership of the country, things might be different. All right, so we have a new administration in place. What would you say to President Tinubu if you were sitting with him on this matter? Uh, well, first of all, I would say that the president needs to be decisive on the financial policy. Now, it is not the remit of the president to uh, determine or give an executive order on the issue of the country's, you know, uh, forex or you know, money because the because of the independence of the uh, of the central bank. However, in terms of the appointment of astute financial gurus who can help to have a turnaround because we don't only need uh, ordinary manager, we need turnaround managers right now. We need both change management in the central bank and in the overhauling of the Nigerian financial sector, and then we need turnaround experts. So the, the, the trajectory of the Nigerian financial industry is descent, is is nose diving, but you would see that the private sector, in other words, the banks, the private banks are not at a loss. As a matter of fact, some of them are having as high as 300%, 700% profit, you know, report on, on an annual basis. So we don't have a brain problem. We have a management problem. So it's almost like an, uh, an engineer who comes in and restructure, rewire the financial sector of the central bank. If we can get that right and we can put a few monetary policy 
in place, I, I think the country will be on the right side. I'm looking forward to seeing someone like Wali Edun. I was expecting to see on the ministerial list uh, someone like Yemi, uh, Yemi Kadoso, uh, who I didn't see on the list, not seeing him on the list. I'm almost beginning to think that maybe he's being reserved for the, uh, the central governorship role when the uh, term of the current president who is under suspension mm -hmm. expires. I don't know, but the president needs to surround himself with a lot of financial engineers who can have a turnaround for the country. Well, thank you so much, Abraham. Great for your time and insight on this very important to topic. Thank you very much for having me. Abraham Great, public affairs analyst, has joined us to take a look at foreign affairs repatriation of over $4 billion in 15 months to Nigeria. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the first hot topic. We'll take a break and come back with our second hot topic. You want to find out what Labour and the federal government and states are saying with regards to a review of the minimum wage. Stay with us.